It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. There's the eighth wonder of the world. There's the ninth wonder, wonder of the world. Now there's the tenth wonder of the world. That's Lars Fredrickson from the iconic band Rancid. Lars in the Hooligans. What else have you done? Uh, Lars and the Hooligans? You have so many names. You have the oh, well, Hooligans. Or, or, the, the Hooligans? What are you talking about, the Hooligans? Aren't, aren't you in a band? I, I, no, it's called the Bastards, dumb shit. Like, you know, it's kind of like, all you got to do is wiki me, bro. All the information's right there. Or text you. I could have just texted you. you actually, that would have even been better. You could actually, have, you got a straight shot to me. Thank which you. a lot of people, a lot of people don't have. The 10th uh, wonder of the world, Uncle Fester. So, but, and, and ladies and gentlemen, our, 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 our producer and our lovely host, Mr. Dennis Farrell. Dennis, we got like one of our favorite guys ever. Oh, today, we talk you know. about him a lot on this podcast on so like Mount Rushmore of interviews we want to do. Uh, I reached out. He said, I don't know who you are, but I know who <laughs> Lars is. Uh, I'm coming on. It's Matt Hardy. Matt, thank you so much for coming on. No, man. Uh, thank you guys for having me, man. I'm, I'm pumped for this. Uh, by the way, I've just been downgraded that I actually have to go through Lars's agent now to get in contact with him. I just got the text from <laughs> Lars, so I just want to keep everybody updated on the saga that's going on through the podcast. That's what you got for botching the band name at the beginning. Yeah, I get that right. <laughs> well, I but, but you know, to Dennis's credit, to, to Dennis's credit, I am in like a hundred bands, so that it's an easy mistake. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an easy mistake. <laughs> I'm gonna just start mashing all the bands together on every intro now. And we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll be a new band name. Well, we won't yeah. even have a t have to have time for a, a, a for a guest if we did that. So, but well, you're, Dennis, you're, you're you're almost very similar to how I am on AW Television. It's Big Money Matt. I'm an entrepreneur, and I manage a ridiculous amount of guys. You know, Private Party, The Butcher and the Blade, uh, yep. TH2, Jora. So obviously, I'm getting a wee fee, only thirty percent, and that's a very small fee to actually get to pick the brain of Matt Hardy with thirty years of experience. So uh, yeah, I, I'm an entrepreneur as well, so I understand the slip up that he makes that mistake. You're a busy man, Lars. Yes, sir, and so are you, Matt, and that's why we should probably uh, start a support group outside of this because I know that you're married, you got a hundred kids. How many kids you yeah. got? I, I have a gaggle of children. <laughs> uh, I have a, I have four kids, four kids under six. Uh, See, my old. That with you that's a basketball team just for yeah. the record yeah for sure we're we're there you know we 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 have one more which could happen at any time and we do we have a starting a starting lineup <laughs> at five people. i have one and that's enough for me i don't know how you guys <laughs> <laughs> oh. i'll tell you i'll tell you what it really is when we were not just outnumbered but you know they had the two to one advantage over us we really like you know we split them up and trying to you know put them in separate parts of the house and and do a two-on-one deal trying to control it and the trickiest thing is is like the two-year-old who still has to be watched at every moment of the day, the six and four-year-old, they, they are somewhat self-sufficient in the big scheme of things, but just having a two-year-old boy who just turned two and then a six month old daughter, that, that is a handful. That's a juggling act. And wow. I try, I try and go to bed early because I know my wife is going to, to ring my phone off the hook at five 30 in the morning. Like get this child. I need to sleep. I need to sleep. <laughs> you know? So we, we sleep when we can there. You learn to, you learn to work on a little sleep when you have young children. I'll be honest. If I were you, I'd sign at every promotion and be on the road until they're 15 and then come back and be like, did I miss anything, guys? I'm not going to lie. When I go on the road to work, that's when I actually sleep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, listen, let's start the questioning off with this. Uh, you are now jumping into the podcast space, which I, I'm always interested to pick the mind of a wrestler who gets into the podcast industry. Because I remember when uh, I started this with Petey, I really had to twist right. his arm to convince him to do it. Petey Williams, by the way, uh, to get into the podcast industry. And then Lars came along, which was the best thing ever. For you, was this kind of like a natural fit? Were you like, yeah, I'm in? Or did someone have to kind of come on? Come on, it'll be fun. You'll do it. You can make money. Come on, come on, get into it. Yeah, I, I think it was a natural progression from my in-ring career. Obviously, as my in-ring career dwindles down and I finish up, you know, like I said, I've been doing this this year will make 30 years for me wow. as a wrestler. And just, you know, I, I've taken a lot of bumps off my bump cards. I would say plural at this time, multiple bump cards. So I, I, John Alba reached out to me and he told me when he was growing up, he was a big fan of the Hardy Boys. He is the host of the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast. 
he was a big fan of the Hardy Boys, but he said he always kind of leaned towards me, which a lot of people love Jeff because Jeff has that it factor. He's like the rock star. He kind of he, he marches to the beat of his own drum. But he said, I looked at you, Matt, and I could tell you were the secret sauce behind the Hardy Boys. And that was very cool. And he reached out and talked to me about this podcast. I talked with Conrad Thompson, who's like the creator of the wrestling podcast in many, many ways. And uh, I, I thought this is a great natural progression. You know, as my in-ring career ends, this is something else I can do. I can still talk about wrestling. And it's like, I'm at that point in my career where I'm ready to open the doors of the locked room that I call my mind and share all my secrets with the world and really break down stuff and, and go into detail about our motivations for doing this or, or the little inside stories behind this. And it's been so much fun. Episode three drops on Friday, the 21st of January. Uh, the episode, the first episode, which was the tag team ladder match, my brother Jeff joined me and we broke it down in detail for an hour. And it was so much fun. And I love that my brother enjoyed that so much because that's not necessarily his cup of tea, you know, but he did dig it. And we also talk about, you know, nostalgia in the past, but we also keep up with the present. And I want my podcast to be different from other wrestling podcasts where I don't focus just on past events, I want to bridge the gap between the past and the present because I still am wrestling with all the, the modern new stars of AEW still actively in the mix. You can find it, The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, anywhere you get podcasts. Yeah. Yes. Well, the one of the things Matt Hardy is, uh, is on everything, Apple, Spotify, Google, and also my YouTube channel where you can watch the video version of it, uh, which is uh, youtube.com backslash Matt Hardy brand. Well, one of the things that's interesting that you're mentioning is, is, you know, the tag team and and the secret sauce. And, you know, I it's like for every successful tag team, Ricky Morton needs a Robert Gibson. Shawn Michaels needs a Marty Jannetty. You know, yeah. you know, Jeff Hardy needed the Matt Hardy. So it's like <clears throat> these things need to happen. This kind of uh, uh, combination of like charisma, talent and obviously um, what you would call it, uh, whatever. I'll find the word later. But there, there was a connection there. So as that team was this, this sort of kind of going its separate ways and they were kind of trying to put you guys into singles and, and stuff like that, was it a hard, like, um, was it hard to, to kind of get back and get into that world because you'd been doing tag team wrestling for so long and you were so successful there? It, it, you know, it, it's definitely a, a big change. You know, when you go from being a tag team competitor to a singles competitor, because you kind of think you have you have a different mindset towards the way you build a match or your strategy behind the story in a match. And whenever I did that, we were at the point where the Hardy Boys became super popular and we did so well. In the year 2000, we sold the most merchandise of any tag team in the history of WWE, which is amazing. And it is so cool that we were able to achieve that level of success. But as time went on, and obviously Jeff was like the standout guy and Vince always chose Jeff over Matt in the Hardy Boys. When it came to Edge and Christian, he always showed Edge over Christian. That's something myself and Christian always have in common. Like we we were a little underrated. We never got all the credit right. we deserve sometimes in his eye. But as they were wanting to move forward with Jeff as a singles, I was super excited to actually get an opportunity because I knew I could do good. Because the Hardy Boys persona of the adrenaline junkie or the daredevil, the guy who's the death defying competitor, wasn't really my strength, even though I played it and I could do that. My, my strength has always been, in my opinion, to play an over-the-top, larger-than-life character. And when I first broke out as a singles and I did Matt Hardy version one, the sensei of Mattitude, I felt like I really shined. And, and, and it blew so many people away that I achieved more success in our first run as singles competitors than my brother did. Was there ever that word <laughs> that one of you guys would be the Marty Jannetty? I, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but they always say no, there's no. always a Marty Jannetty in the group. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it is what it is. And it's funny how that became like a big analogy for the partner that was like least over or least successful. And I think with me having the realization of understanding like Jeff is one of the most beloved figures in all of wrestling ever in history. I mean, it's insane how beloved he is. So working on a scale with him, you have to realize to be realistic and like, hold up, you can still be magnificent and super popular and people dig you but you know you, you can't compare yourself to him because everyone is different you know and it's a race once again you're much better off when you don't feel like you're racing against somebody you feel like you're racing against yourself to do better and improve upon yourself so yeah it, it th that wasn't a stress ever i i just wanted a chance to be able to to do my own I, I wanted to be able to tell my own stories and and put my own recipes together to create this masterpiece that i eventually wanted to do it and i felt good about that and looking back at my career you know, if someone says like, well, you know, you have Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Jeff Hardy, historically always more popular, but 
if you could have a 30 year career like Matt Hardy's had, most people would. I mean, that's, you know, big money, Matt, it's an exaggeration on TV, but there is some reality to that as well. Like I've done pretty good in wrestling, you know, and I'm proud of that fact. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I always seen wrestlers like you got some green days and you got some Ramones and I always was more like drawn to the Ramones, um, not putting you in any category. I guess, I guess for me, it's like, you know, you've, you've done so much in, in the world of wrestling. Um, you know, you've done so much, you've been through so many, you know, situations in your life over 30 freaking years. I mean, that's a lot of experience. So yeah. how do you still kind of, um, keep that character of yours? continuing down, reinventing, you know, where are you drawing inspiration from? Music, books, TV, what, what is it? Where are, you, where are you drawing the inspiration to kind of keep developing your character? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes from different places at different times. Like, for instance, whenever I did Broken Matt Hardy a few years back, my whole mentality about that is when the wrestling style was starting to change and I was getting older and I understood that I had to work differently. Like I couldn't wrestle or work like I did when I was 25 years old, when I was a young man. So I had to like modify my game to work to my strengths. And then I felt like if I commit myself to a character that's larger than life, over the top, maybe even a little supernatural, a throwback to the Undertakers or Papa Shango's when those guys were around, I said, and if I delve into this head first and fully commit to it and in any interview I do, any promo I do, I'm in the gimmick. I talk with this weird accent. Uh, that was motivated in many ways by different TV shows. If you've ever seen the ca uh, cartoon Solid Fingers, which is by David Firth on YouTube, it's a very weird, strange cartoon. Solid Fingers was a big inspiration in Broken Matt. Uh, also television shows where there's a lot of stuff that came out of True Blood because I was a True Blood fan. And I, I thought this is the coolest thing ever, how vampires you know, are immortal and they live in these different time periods and different stages. And you would see Eric Northman, which is Alexander Skarsgård. And, you know, he's you know, got long hair and he's dressed as they were dressed in the 1800s. Then you get to see him in the early 1900s. Now you see him in current day, the 2000s. I said, that's so cool. How could I integrate this into a wrestling character? Obviously, I can't be immortal in reality, in real, in real life. But what if I could say that something has happened? Something is yeah, not 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 everybody could be Gangrel. Come on. Right. <laughs> not everybody can be a shoot Gangrel for sure. I said, but what if something happened and I broke down the barriers of my mind and I was cognizant of where my soul, my essence has been. And I can report that, that everybody, uh, everybody, every vessel it has been in, I have followed that. But now I'm in this professional wrestler known as Matt Hardy. That is my current vessel that I'm just in. And that was my, that was my attempt to be immortal, you know, focused mm. off true blood. A lot of the biting that I did as Broken Mad came from that as well, the blood. There was stuff from Dexter that was incorporated in that. A lot of uh, Rustin Cole, Matthew McConaughey from True Detective. A lot of TV shows played into the whole Broken Mad character. And I know there were a lot of people that, like, contact me, you know, a few months into that, and they're like, man, are you all right? Are you, like, yeah. are you fucked up on drugs? <laughs> like, what's going on? You know, I'm like, actually, I'm more sober than I've ever been, brother, <laughs> you know? Well, but that's the funny thing about that whole yeah character i mean the the amount of stir that that caused in the world of wrestling for a fan and and just inside the business people yeah. thought you were legit out of your fucking tree and you were working it yeah. Yeah. and and that's the and it, but see i don't necessarily know if i saw through that because I, I i'm not gonna lie i was taken in as well but it, when you look back in retrospect it takes a real sober indiv individual to actually do that yeah yeah for sure for sure. And, and I remember, you know, there were times where once it became like a viral sensation after myself and my brother did the final deletion. And, you know, I feel like we were pretty influential on cinematic wrestling at that time, which yeah. actually was super beneficial during the pandemic era. You know, when all, all these uh, all the companies were doing these empty arena shows, you know, during the pandemic, uh, the cinematic match was a great outlet to do a very entertaining way that you could get away with because there weren't fans in the building. So after the final deletion and deleter decay, uh, the great war, all these matches we did, I remember TNA had me set up to do an interview with Dave Meltzer. And, you know, obviously Dave Meltzer being the, the leading wrestling journal journalist in the game, you know, they wanted to get serious with us. But I'm going to tell you, if I'm doing it, I'm all in on broken mat. And I'm going to be talking about being in different vessels. And you know, when I'm looking at 1700, I said, you got to tell Dave that that's the only way I'm doing it. It's it's un it, that, that, those are my conditions. And I did it. And he went along with it. I did Jericho's podcast for an hour and 10 minutes. Jericho acted like I was fucked up and out of my head crazy. And he, he went along with it. And we did a super entertaining broken mat, Chris Jericho, hour and 10 minute podcast, totally in gimmick. 
is it hard to let go of that when it's time to move on from that character and you start, you know, turning into more of a traditional Matt Hardy again? Is it hard to let go? Because I still hear it in yeah. your interviews that you still have the voice. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if that's by design or if it's just something you can't let go of. It, it, it is hard to let go of it. And, and there, there's a lot of bereavement when I had to let go of Broken Matt and we came back to WWE, like showing up at WrestleMania 33. Right. And I would try, I would try to be very cognizant of that time to still portray parts of, of that characteristic, but then still integrate the old school Hardy boy into it as well. So it wasn't such a, an instant change to a wrestling fan that's viewing, viewing me. I, I'm all about continuity in wrestling and, and I try to make things make sense. Even this last time, whenever we came back during the pandemic era and I segued into Big Money Matt, what I'm currently doing, a guy who's this big carny who's trying to make a dollar off everyone he possibly can, that was inspired by the guy who first helped myself and my brother get our foot in the door at WWE and do jobs and, and be enhancement guys. And that's the Italian stallion. Him and George South, those were guys, they were enhancement guys, you know, for years and years and years. They had a promotion in North Carolina. We started working with them. And if we would do... You know, they would do shows every Friday and Saturday, and we got a lot of uh, ring experience under our belts because of them, which I appreciated, but we never got paid. We had to do all the shows for free if we wanted to go to WWE and do jobs, and, you know, get looked at by all the WWE guys at that time. Whenever we'd go, we'd work three nights. We'd do Raw, we'd do Challenge, and Superstars, and we were going to be paid 150 bucks a night. And for us, as broke kids, not making any money, right. trying to get our foot in the door, that was huge. And I'll never forget the first day, after we made 150 and we're like, man, we just made $150 for a wrestling match. This is unreal, man. We're actually going to, we're going to do this, you know, and I'm 18 and my brother's 16 at this juncture. And uh, we get in the van, there's 14 guys, stallions driving us out. He goes seven or eight miles into the middle of nowhere where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very wooded foresty era area. And he goes, okay, guys, if you guys want to continue with me and go to the next town and work tomorrow, I am going to need, a hundred dollars of that, of that 150. That is my booking fee. It's 66%. So then, you know, we're more or less like stuck there because if we didn't turn over a hundred dollars to him, he was going to drop us out in the middle of nowhere. So wow. you have 14 guys, he's driving around in this church van, and, you know, we all pay him a hundred of the 150 we'd made that night. So big money, Matt taking a wee fee of 33% was inspired by the Italian saying who actually did that to me. And I'm kind of cutting my guys a break because I got charged 66% as a booking fee. Lars, can I cast one more question? Uh, to double back to that WrestleMania moment, which was by far the loudest pop I think I've ever heard, and probably, I, I think all of us, an amazing moment, because I didn't know you were coming out then. Was there, was, was there in the back of your mind, do I, and I know you kind of touched on it, do I come out as Matt Hardy? Do I come out as Broken Matt? Do I do a hybrid? Because, you know, it's the WWE crowd at that point, and yep. I think most at that point fans were just, that product only they didn't really venture so much outside the wrestling bubble yeah it, I, my mindset going into that was to do a hybrid of it and then try and very naturally progress into being more of a hardy boy and in my, my initial talks when we got our deal together we had had that like five or six weeks out you know talking to triple h and, and vince and whatnot and it was they did a really good job of keeping a very small circle of people that knew about our appearance and then it was so funny. I'll, I'll tell you how far WWE went and like kayfabing the whole deal. We were working that weekend in Orlando at WrestleCon. Myself and my brother, we were in the, the main event of the WrestleCon show that night against uh, Penta and Phoenix, which obviously everyone knows them now from their AEW run. And then the next day we were wrestling the Young Bucks in a ladder war, which was going to be a crazy match. And then Sunday, everybody thought we were leaving to go home, but obviously we we're going to be, you know, re-debuting at WWE again in that ladder match and winning the tag team titles. So we ended up flying down early. That Thursday evening, they told all the competitors where they were practicing, you know, their match and stuff. Uh, sorry, guys, um, we can't do this at the hotel because the hotel won a little ladders in the match, in the, in the hotel, in the area where the ring is. So we can't bring ladders in there. There's some sort of code. So we've got to go to a, a very secret uh, in the middle of nowhere location to, to rehearse and go over the match. Okay. And guys like, was the, uh, was the Italian stallion there? <laughs> <laughs> he was not fortunately. So he wasn't getting any of that cut. That was a big payday. We were getting too. He would have really, he, he would, he would have made a good, a good day, a good payday that day. Yeah. But uh, they, they told the guys, we got to go to this very remote location to rehearse the match and go over. And there were three teams, obviously Seamus Cesaro, the good brothers. Uh, and then the other team was Enzo and Cass. 
and they were starting to go over to the match. They put us in an SUV, windows tinted, everything, and they drove us in, and they said, surprise, there's one more team in this match. They didn't even tell them until that point. And I'll never forget Carl Anderson, who I love so much, such a, a great friend of mine, uh, as the doors were opening. I remember the doors were opening, and I could hear him hit us with one of our catchphrases. He said, Brother Nero, I knew you'd come. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got on and say, guys, there's a fourth team in this match. It's the Hardy Boys. And that was the first time they were told. You know, there, there, there was like little buzzes going on, you know, as far as in the dressing room and whatnot. Oh, maybe the Hardys are coming back because they're definitely not with Impact. And we did all we could to convince them that we were with Ring of Honor. We even won the tag team titles and just dropped them back that night before the ladder match and, and returning to WrestleMania. But that was just such an amazing weekend, you know, looking back at hindsight. And, and the reaction, we, we literally rushed up to Gorilla five minutes before we were going to go out. You know, so just, you know, we see Shawn Michaels and, and Vince McMahon and John Cena's there, just all these reunions and hugging people. Hey, what's up? Da, 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 da. And then we're getting ready to walk out. And usually at the venue, you always see the setup and the, and the way it looks. And, you know, there's obviously the sea of humanity out there. So we haven't seen the setup and just walking through that curtain and going down that long ass ramp, you know, and there's 70, 80,000 people going crazy and doing delete, yeah. delete. I mean, that moment was so surreal and, and it, it felt dreamlike, you know, looking back in my head, but it was one of the most amazing moments of my career for sure. I vividly remember it feeling like a dream as we were walking down that aisle heading to the ring. Well, I'm, I'm actually physically, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm getting goosebumps about it because that was like of all wrestling moments, like probably top 10 to see you guys, you Thank know, you. in that setting. But, um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was like kayfabe and, and I feel like, you know, with the modern wrestling and how it's sort of, um, come to be, you know, it's a lot of spots. It's a lot of fast moving stuff. You know what right. I mean? And you come from a school, like you're kind of unique because there's only like really a handful of guys who are still doing it that come from, like you said, 30 years ago, yeah. where there's like this, uh, um, you know, you need the psychology and there's a reason, the storytelling, these things. And I mm -hmm. feel like some promotions do it better than others these days. There's a, still a lot of that crash course TV. <clears throat> so as you're in your position now, where you're signed kind of like an elder statesman with a wealth of knowledge. And you're kind of looking at the product these day, uh, uh, of, of today and your role in AEW. Like, are, are you sort of, you know, giving any advice or, 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 or letting other wrestlers, you know, you know, helping them out, you know, to tell the story? Because, I mean, that's what the Hardy Boys did. They did tell a story. They did, you know, there was a meaning and a reason behind every ladder bump in, in these things. It wasn't just for, you know, the, the uh, crash course, crash, you know, crash course TV effect. It was, there was something to it. There was a story involved. So are you able to, to sort of kind of give them that, that, that uh, knowledge or, you know, help them out advice? Yes, without, without a deal. The people who had been part of the HFO, the Hardy family office, the faction that I was managing, you know, and I was like taking them for a big cut of their money, you know, based off the Italian science gig. It's almost like what you see on screen as far as like being their, their real life mentor is, is something that is actual reality behind the curtain, you know, and behind the scenes. Like Private Party, those two guys, Isaiah Casti and Mark Quinn, I'm so proud of their growth. And like mm. they became hills with me as, as they like adapted my ways. And they, they listen to me, but they have grown so much as far as viciousness. And one of the first things that Michael Hayes taught myself and my brother was like, sure, you guys can do all these amazing athletic acrobatics and these cool moves and whatnot. But if the casual fan that is sitting in the first few ro rows looks at you and doesn't believe you can beat the shit out of somebody, kick the shit out of somebody, if they don't believe you have that true fundamental aggression, they'll never buy into you completely. Right. And that's a message I was able to, to really pass on the private party. And they have really taken that and they ran with it and like Isaiah's character has come so so far and I know when people when they first started with AEW people were like oh my god they had this great match with the Young Bucks they've always been extremely athletic and talented but now they have the knowledge and the mental capacity when it's time for them to be put in a position to be the tag team champions they're going to be ready for that run on top and I'm so proud of their growth Butcher and Blade as well they're two guys I do the same thing with I was I was talking with Butcher last night Andy is just an absolute sweetheart but he said he's the best some, he's the best man he said some of these times i've seen where like 
Tony would come up to you like, okay, Matt, uh, I just, can you do a promo? Can you talk about, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and, blah, 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 and we're rushing and I have like 30 seconds to think about it. He said, and I saw you walk out through the curtain and you do like a two minute promo and you, you seem cool as a cucumber, like you're not sweating. And I was like, well, you know, that's how it is. You kind of process it. You, you breathe, take your time and you have to remain cool. That's the only way you do it. And he said, I've been so motivated from watching you do stuff like that. It's helped me like relax and like find Zen, you know, uh, but, because it, it's very easy to get stressed out sometimes in those critical situations, especially when you're on like a live TV. But the most important thing I feel like you can remember when you're out there performing is like, just be confident in yourself, just breathe, take your time and you can make it work. You can't stress yourself out. There's so many things in life, and I've learned this too, between my addiction, you know, I had a battle with addiction in the past, as everyone knows, you know, I've learned going past that and then being a father of so many beautiful kids, I, I have learned that I can only control the things I can control. I can't focus or stress out on things that are out of my control. You have to let it go. And that's like a very important acceptance that all human beings have to have to ultimately make for themselves. You notice he said so many kids. He didn't even name them. That's how many he has. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll give know, him a big shout out. I've got King Maxwell, Lord Wolfgang, Czar Bar, Bartholomew, and Empress Evie. Those are my so kids' gimmicks whenever they're in the bro broken universe. So, so you, so you have a Wolfgang? Yeah, yeah. I have my oldest is Wolfgang. Yeah, yep. That is our our my my oldest is is Maxwell. Uh, my I he was my that was my name. Uh, my wife and I chose that, and then she went for the second name. She's a big. She would play the piano when we were doing the Broken Mass stuff. She's a great uh -huh. pianist, and she was a big fan of Wolfgang. Obviously, she likes the name and wouldn't use. So Wolfgang is our, our, our second son's name. Uh, Woofy is what he's called. Bartholomew is our youngest boy. We call him Barty. And then our youngest daughter is Ever, and her nickname is Evie. Everyone's big fans of Pokemon now, but Ever Hardy was the <laughs> name we were going to be if our first kid had been a girl. So we ended up getting to get that name back, too, and one of, one of my big things, we've had four kids. I, I wanted to be a girl dad as well. Like, I feel like I've been pretty lucky in these 47 years I've been alive and, and walking this earth. Like I've lived almost every aspect of life as possible. Uh, I've been a boy dad multiple times over. And it's so great because I kind of almost vicariously through my two oldest, I get to relive myself and my brother's childhood together. It's very similar. You know, we're on the same property, the Hardy compound. It's a hundred acres, you know, in the middle of North Carolina, you know, in, in the wilderness, and then uh, I'm a girl dad now, too. And that was very important to me. So I'm glad my wife was OK with being this insane baby making machine until we got a girl. Too. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to touch because I've got so many questions here. I want to at least go back to the cinematic universe stuff that you've done yeah. and, and how phenomenal it was. And at the time, did you understand what you were doing to the industry by changing it when you were doing this stuff? I don't, I don't think I realized how impactful it was there. I, I mean, I really, my whole focus, even when I did Broken Matt and I said I was going to, you know, turn back the clock, you know, to the days of the really supernatural Undertaker or the Papa Shango, you know, the, the program he had with the Ultimate Warrior where the green goo was coming out of his head and whatnot. I really want to do stuff over the top. And I just said, let's make it as different as it can possibly be. Because right now, athleticism is really being focused in the ring with smaller guys. I said, so what if we like tried to change up the game plan? We did this fight literally, which was like all over our property. And we filmed it like a movie almost. And it was like a, a, you know, a match that existed in almost like a, a movie or a, a cinematic form. And that was my whole mindset with doing this. And lo and behold, it's so insane that the pandemic came around when it did. And then AEW, who is known for their in-ring product, you know, kind of obviously through so many, you know, monkey wrenches in everyone's plans. That stadium stampede match that myself and Chris Jericho, you know, we like headed up our teams and whatnot. The Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Hangman Adam Page was in it. We look back on that match and we are so proud of it. And Chris Jericho says it's one of his favorite matches of all time and, and mine as well, because the entertainment value was off the charts for that. And I mean, literally, we couldn't have anybody. We could have 10 people like in, a, in, a, in an arena, in a setting at that time because of the crazy COVID rules that were going on. That was right at the beginning of the pandemic before we knew what was going on. And to have a pay-per-view that had this insane cinematic movie match that was as successful and as entertaining and told such a great story where to me it was fun and more casual people uh, than ever had told me that's their favorite cinematic match of all time. There are obviously the diehard wrestling purists that hate that because it's not the in-ring competition where guys are like, you know, killing each other and, you know, working Japanese strong style and whatnot, but it is what it is, man. I think wrestling at the end of the day 
you know, it's two guys who are trying to tell a story in the ring. Typically one's a good, one's a bad guy. It's entertainment. So like, it's okay when something is overly entertaining. It's okay. I think people can deal with it. Well, you know, I want to kind of get into like the, the real current and what's been happening over the last couple of years, um, just with the forbidden door being opened. And now you're seeing Mickey James, who's the TNA champion going, doing the Royal Rumble, you know, it's, or whatever they're calling it these days is it's still the Royal no, yeah. no, no. The, is it still? Are they still calling it the Royal Rumble, or is it just the Rumble? It's called Gunther now. <laughs> All right. Oh, what a good so anyway, timely reference. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. But anyways, so um, I guess my point is, is, is you know, you come from this this place when you were cutting your teeth, where there wasn't a lot of that stuff. Right. And then you had, you know, and then now you have a front row seat to watch it all unfold. Do you think it helped the business in any way? And if so, what do you, what did you see? Uh, how did you see it helping it? How did you see it open up? It, it really shows how much AEW is changing and uh, causing the business to evolve, I think, in many capacities. Because Vince McMahon is so protective of yeah. his IP and, and the WWE. And because AEW has been as hot as it is, obviously, whenever Dynamite started, you know, he took NXT and I mean, literally, he just like said, OK, I, I'm not really worried if we have to sacrifice NXT, it's fine. Let's put them head to head, you know, and obviously with that Wednesday Night Wars where we were battling one another going head to head, AEW won that. But like Vince McMahon specifically put that NXT head to head against AEW to try and cut into the audience to try and slow us down from gaining any momentum on his Raw and SmackDown viewerships. That was his initial mindset behind it. And then once we started, Tony was working with other places with the Impacts, and, and you had myself and Private Party show up on Impact, and we, we did a story there. You had guys uh, coming from New Japan in. You had guys coming in from Impact, guys coming, gals from NWA, Thunder Rosa showing up and working you know, from NWA on AEW. It, it really made it's so compelling. It's so interesting to watch. And you, you want to tune in every single week besides just great action and the great all elite wrestling talent and roster. You never know who can show up. Right. And this appearance of Mickey James in the Royal Rumble, I feel like Vince was just pushed to do this because now he has to continue to keep up with AEW and how they are unpredictable and how you never know who's going to show up. And I, and I feel like if there's no AEW, if there's no forbidden door, Vince doesn't do that. He doesn't bring outside talent into the Royal Rumble. And it's great for the business in general because it has pushed Vince to change. I feel like, and I, I feel like most people would, would agree with me on this. Vince really became stagnant. The WD became stagnant over all those years where there was no competition and he wasn't pushed. The best time in wrestling from a viewership perspective and, and, and money-making perspective were, were the Monday Night Wars. And that's because WCW Nitro went head-to-head -head with Raw and they pushed Vince McMahon to come up with some new creative and different shit. And that's almost what AEW is doing right now to WWE. And the wrestlers, it gives them many more places to work. It also trickles down to all the other companies that are smaller. It makes business better for them. And it, it's, it's a great environment for all the fans because there's so many different choices and there's so many people... That, that watch wrestling now, and, and it is more unpredictable because AEW has forced WWE to change their ways. So it's, it's a great time in the wrestling world. Now, I this is going to be my dirt sheet question, and I'm going to steal a little something that Lars likes to say to some people. I don't want you to give me the corporate answer on this. I want the real deal here. You had a, I'll give you the real deal. You had a very public split with uh, Impact Wrestling, <clears throat> which at the end got resolved. And it changed the way yep. impacted business with letting wrestlers keep their gimmick. When you went back in for your forbidden door appearance on impact, was there any weirdness to you? Like, like almost like I'm going back to school for the first time. Uh -huh. uh, no, it, it was, it was all happy. It was all hugs. And Ed Nordham, the guy who was the head of Anthem that did that. It, it turns out, Whenever we were going through our negotiations, Jeff Jarrett was there and he, he wasn't in the best place in his life. He was making some bad decisions. And, and, and fortunately, he's in a great place now after getting everything together. And he was just kind of manipulating Ed and Ed didn't know what he was getting into as far as the wrestling business goes. And then, you know, obviously we leave there, we go to WWE and, and my wife, who she, she's not afraid to go scorch the earth on somebody. That was her with that whole deal on, on impact, you know, she, she's a, she's a, a, a Bariqua, you know, she's a Puerto Rican that was born and raised in New York It's New York minute. Her temper is like this big, you know, it is almost non-existent, you know, so she, she has a very short fuse and she got hot with them. And just the, 
the, the fact that the split happened and it was public and all the blowback they got from it, especially when we made our triumphant return to WWE and, and it was such a huge deal. And just us being back at WWE, being back home was such a huge deal at that time. It, it was a big blow to them. And then they changed their policy. And I feel like for goodwill, they ended up doing that. Like, not only are we going to let you keep Broken Mat, you know, we've been fighting over a little bit. We're going to let all our competitors keep their IP and they can take that gimmick wherever. And we talked things through. We had conversations. We sat down and talked with Ed and just going back to impact and being able to sit there and give him an embrace and hug like, Hey man, I'm glad everything is, you know, water under the bridge and, and we're all good. And I hope we can work together more in the future. And he just said, it was such a, a learning lesson for me. And he was really like thrown into the fire because he didn't know what he was getting into, but he, he learned a very tough lesson right from the jump. And uh, at the end of the day, everything turned out good. Everybody's cool with one another. And it's one of those things too. Like I had learned this even going through that, I'm at a point in my life, I've been through so many amazing, successful moments, and I've been through very low lows too. Like anybody who harbors hate in their soul, it's just like a waste of time. It hurts you more than it hurts anybody else. Like there's just no, no reason to have any of that. And I never did with those guys anyways, just like it was a, a different, obviously a difference of business, the way we looked at it and the way we agreed upon things and everything got smoothed over, obviously. But at the end of the day, man, uh, I'm happy things worked. And I, I'm also happy that I'm the person that I am now where I don't hold any kind of resentment towards anyone. And if something happens, I just look at it as it's business and move on for it. I mean, and that's kind of an attitude not a lot of people share. And I think that happens with age. I think that happens with experience because when you're yeah. 20, 30 something with your, you know, your cock out and ready to rock, it's like, <laughs> you know, right. everybody's an enemy, right? So and, and people have that ability to change by, you know, obviously, hopefully you're having some humility in your life at some point. Yeah. But I guess, you know, you getting into that space, um, what was the aha moment to kind of go, fuck, I need to clean myself up. Um, and I need to have a little a massive dose of humility here. And my perspective needs to change. Um, was it one moment? Was a series? Of, was it a series of events? Like, how, you know, where did that change happen? Yeah, I, I mean, a, a lot of that happened. You know, obviously, with all the stuff myself and my brother did, uh, we got to that point where I, I remember telling some of the people in town relations at WWE, I was just like, you know, hey, like I, I couldn't get out of bed this morning. You know, I've been doing these leg drops, you know, off the top and off the second for fifteen years. You know afforded to 10 days you know in a row i said so i was like can i get some time off they're like no we can't lose you on the road right now you know just go to your doctor see what they can do and then you go there they go well you know you could have some sort of corrective surgery to try and fix this or make it a little better or i can give you these you know and it's like pain pills and muscle relaxers and then you know once once you step into that it's a very slippery slope and just mm -hmm. Getting through that and me burning out on every level, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And then once once you get your shit together and you realize like how good you have life. And, and also for me, it was like accepting as I get older, nobody goes over on Father Tom, right? Father Tom will kick all our ass at the end of the day. As you get older, you have to change the way. You have to modify the way you wrestle as well. And, yeah. and it's, it's much more focused on storytelling. <clears throat> Between those events and then just being a father whenever I had my first son, that changed everything. Because a, a lot of us, if, if we're fortunate enough to have some sort of celebrity, be in some sort of a spotlight, it's, it's really easy to have an ego and look at yourself and have a, have a very high opinion of yourself. I'm like, oh yeah, I've, got, I've done a lot of cool shit and I've made it, I'm successful and I've got money and I've got, I've got stuff. But then when you have that kid, it's like you look at this individual, you're like, this human being depends on me for everything. And, and finally, I, I, I might have some sort of ego, but fuck that because this, this kid, this child that I've created is much more important than me. And I would give my life for this child, you know? So then having four of those, that's, I live now to make sure I can spend all the time possible with my children. And I, I wanna, myself and my brother, uh, our mom died when we were young and our dad raised us, we were dirt poor. And so, so I know what it's like to come from nothing and, and work hard and be able to achieve it, but I wanna be able to give my kids a better start. So. You know, if, if they have connections, if they do want to wrestle, whatever they want to do, if they want to sing, if they want to wrestle, if they want to be in a band, if they want to run a lemonade stand, whatever they want to do, I'm going, I'm going to support them. But I hope I can also build a great foundation for them where they have a head start, something that I didn't get or my brother didn't get when we were young. Dennis, I'm sorry. Can I just yeah. piggyback on this? Because there's something that you said there, because I feel like any successful person, you need to be the cock of the walk and you need to think of yourself yeah. like that yeah. because that's how you get successful. Yes. There is that element to it, right? So 
softening over the years and like you said changing your wrestling style like you know where do you and, and now and then you said even storytelling you know so for you at this point of your life you know is that creative freedom and this is something i ask a lot of wrestlers because i know you're a wrestling fan growing up is that yep. creative freedom more important to you now i know that you got money and what all that stuff but if you look back what's most important is it the creative freedom or is it the money? I mean, creative freedom is, is definitely the most important at this juncture. And, and also it's very important that I want to see my kids. I, I want my kids to see me wrestling. Like my two oldest now, they're like all into it. And it's so cool. It's the coolest thing ever, you know, but it, it's, it's so funny. My oldest, Maxwell, who's six and a half, they uh, came to Raleigh the other day and they saw some of the guys. They were both big Orange Cassidy fans, you know, Maxwell and Wolfie, my oldest too. And they're back there. They said, you know what, dad, you know, you're our favorite wrestler and you always will be, but like Jungle Boy is so cool. Like, would you, take this, <laughs> would you take this video of me and send it to Jungle Boy? Because me and him, we kind of look at like, we have long hair. We're like real slender and thin. And like, you know, we're, we're both, we're both handsome guys, <laughs> which is so great. I, I love being in that, in that dad role. But yeah, man, it, it, it's, it's very important just having that, that creative input into what you're doing because it's just so liberating. And at the end of the day, this might be something you can relate to. The, the two things I want more than anything else to this juncture, because I have lived such a complete life in my time here. It, I want to be happy and I want to be healthy. And if I can do those, then I'm, I'm good. And, you know, if I'm wrestling, I'm not working today in my life because it's something I love. It's something I'm passionate about. So on, on, on top of like making pretty good money, you know, and then having that creative input into stuff, just, just being happy and healthy, man, is my, is my recipe for success in life nowadays. Uh, I want to piggyback on the sobriety question. Ask both you guys this because you both are sober. Is who was the one person in both of your lives that really you leaned on in the time of need? Uh, my, mine, mine, I would say it was my wife for sure. I, I mean, my wife is, uh, is is very outspoken, and people who know her, as we were talking about that TNA situation, whenever we had our business split, she was was very outspoken to it you know she had people in shows chanting fuck that owl you know whenever the whole tna thing went down because the owl was the you know mascot of of anthem at that juncture so she is very outspoken but if i didn't have her being on my ass like she was when i got my shit together i, I don't know i might not be here i i, I could i could possibly uh, i could possibly have died without a doubt so she was on my ass she kept me in check and she she showed me the tough love that i needed at that time and because of that i will always uh, have a love for her that is that is never ending yeah I, I mean there was a lot of people who helped me along the way but I think at the end of the day it wasn't really depending on any kind of human because every from my experience every human's fucking fallible yeah. so I had to, I had to get spiritual you know and I had to find that route because there was no way that I was going to be able to abstain from the negative behavior because you know like I've said before, it's like, you know, if any time I drank or used, I'd have an allergic reaction, I'd break out in handcuffs, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so for me, I had to find something different, you know what I mean? I had to find a different way, a different path, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I never really shared that in my public life because that was my own personal life. And, and, and I, and up until recently, you know, I'm 50 years old now. I don't really, I could give two shits anymore. Like, it's like, you want to see my dick? Cool. You know, like, I don't care anymore. Like, there's no, there's no hiding, you know? Right. No, well, I'm not asking you guys. Okay. I mean, I, just I know sure. privately when we get off, you'll ask and I get it. <laughs> but no, but my, my point is, is that it's like, I'm like you kind of what, you know, what you were saying, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I've kind of done a lot of these things and now I'm just, my, my tolerance for people's bullshit is like this big. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I'm just, and if you don't, if you want to be in that negative place or whatever, cool, I'm walking on over here because I don't really have time to stay there and meddle with you. You know, I have to move on here because I have bigger things like kids, mm -hmm. job, the Puerto Rican wife, who's got a hair tr trigger of a temper. It's like, those are the things <laughs> yeah. that, that are, you know, that, that are important. Mine isn't Puerto Rican, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, my, yeah. my yep. point is, is that they still got hair triggers, but yeah, you know, yeah, so that, that to answer your question, if that helps. So is it now my question? It is now your question. <laughs> okay, so Hardy's, the name, you know what I mean? I'm sure you've talked about it over the years. What made you come to that? Uh, I mean, it's just our real shoot name. 
you know, uh, Matt and Jeff Hardy. And I feel like whenever we started doing enhancement work back in the day and they said, oh, these guys, their, their real name is Matt Hardy and, and Jeff Hardy. Oh, put them together. Call them the Hardy Boys. It's kind of like those mystery novels. The book, books. Maybe it'll, yeah, maybe it'll catch on. We'll just spell it with a Z instead. So that that is where that started. And, and, and thankfully for us, especially being in the WWE system, you know, whenever they give people a name now, you know, they, they're going to own that and it's going to be their property. So you can't carry that with you. So it was a blessing in disguise that we were able to use our real name, even though it wasn't some super or flashy, it's something we can carry with us wherever we go, whatever promotion, whatever company. Okay, because that was my setup question to this question. Sorry, Dennis. Because one of the things I think that is wrong with professional wrestling, and I'm just a fan, I don't know anything, is when they get these guys off the indies, they mold them, they change their names, right? And then they try to mold them into something else, and then they fail miserably or whatever it is. My question is, that persona that you make out there on the indies or whatever, how you're coming up, you know, I'm not talking about like winning the game show and then going to the WWE. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about, you know, working your way, having the Italian stallion moments, whatever, you know, these things make you who you are. So do you think there's something fundamentally wrong with taking an ind- individual from the indies, let's say changing their gimmick and making them try to do something completely different than what made them successful in the beginning? I mean, I, I really feel like it's counterproductive. I mean, because if you're going to hire somebody because of their work on the indie, obviously that is what attracted you to them in the first place. So why are you going to try and like remold them? Why, why would you not highlight their strengths? And, and obviously if they're doing that, that's stuff that they feel comfortable doing. I feel like as pro wrestlers, we're all at our best whenever we are doing things that we feel comfortable doing. And I know Vince McMahon, I, I know this for a fact, I've, I've heard in conversations, he likes to push people out of their comfort zones. And he said, that's the only time you grow. And there is truth to that. But I feel like if you have a, a character or persona that has attracted people and, and, and they, they like you enough to like hire you and put you under a contract, I don't know why you still wouldn't utilize that, maybe morph it or, you know, kind of change it on the, you know, on the path uh, to becoming, you know, whatever you're going to be on their television program. But as far as like, you know, shit canning the entire identity and the whole persona and, and starting them something new that they might not be as comfortable with. I mean, it just, it feels counterproductive to me. I feel like you're much better when you allow somebody to go out and, and be an extension of themselves, uh, you know, with someone showcasing a personality where they've got to turn to a 10 or 11, you know, like Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, that's how it is. You, when you would see him go out and be the, the hell raising Stone Cold Steve Austin, that is just him on maximum overload volume. You know, and that's when guys are at their best. And it, and it comes off as authentic, I think, through the television screen. There's so many times on WWE programming, you know, over the course of the last five, six, seven years that I've seen guys and just they're, they're doing something and it doesn't seem genuine because they don't seem totally comfortable doing it. And pro wrestling, even though it is what it is and it's entertainment, people are at their best because we're not like actors. We're not these dramatic, subtle actors that do the little subtleties. We are best when we're being something very similar to our real personality, something that we're comfortable with. It really shines through because when someone's doing something they're not comfortable with, it comes across as awkward and like unauthentic on screen, I think. Big time wrestling, March 12th out in New England. This is, by the way, we got time for one more question yeah. piece. Uh, you're tagging with your brother for the first time in three years. And mm-hmm. In and out of your 30-year history of being a tag team with your brother, you both have grown. Your styles have changed. You develop more in different moves, and your personas have taken similar paths. They've they've crossed. They've you know went separate ways, and now they're coming back. When you go into a situation like this with your brother, do you guys have to have more conversations on uh, how you guys are going to be a tag team? Is it just something that's automatic and you'll get in there and figure it out? I I don't even really know how to ask this question, but I mean, 30 years, things have changed. How do you guys keep up in ring with being the Hardys? I I mean, I'll I'll be honest when it comes to myself and Jeff teaming up and, and being the Hardy boys, it's like riding a bike. You just get back on and, and you start pedaling and it's just business as usual. So that, that's one thing that's really cool, you know, knowing that uh, I, I've literally been there since this guy was born, <laughs> you know, his whole life. So we really know each other inside and out. And, and it's going to be fun. And Jeff's excitement and passion for wrestling has been so renewed now that he has this new horizon in front of him. So mm-hmm. very excited about that. And I, I'm, 
I'm, without going too much into detail, I'm very excited to where 2022 is going to take the Hardy Boys. And I feel like it's going to be a great year for both Matt and Jeff. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, this is a kind of an obvious question, but, um, you know, we are asked often, mm -hmm. you know, by people who watch this um, about Vince McMahon stories and for guys who have worked with them, you know, and we sometimes we ask it, sometimes we don't. But do you have like a favorite Vince McMahon story or something that always stuck with you, something maybe he said to you? There's a there's there's a, a bunch of great Vince McMahon stories. Here's one that is very, very simple. Uh, we're, we're taking a charter. It was not the plane flight from hell. It was a different one. Right. Uh, we were coming back from Europe and we were on a charter charter uh, flight. And uh, a lot of the guys had been drinking wine. Uh, Vince was very red wine buzzed. He was in a good mood. And he had told people he is going to show everyone how tough he is by pinning Kurt Angle, taking down this Olympic gold medalist and pinning Kurt Angle on this flight. So you see these multiple attempts, attempts where Vince tries to sneak up on Kurt and he tries to grab him from behind. You see Kurt reversing it, bam, slam him down right on top of Vince, shuts him down immediately. I mean, this happens over and over and over again. And there's one point where Vince comes up to me, he goes, Hardy, you son of a bitch. I want you to get Kurt Angle and I want you to tell him to come to the back of the plane. I'm going to be hiding in this certain area right there where the stewardess is, where, where their little area is. And whenever he comes by, I'm going to tap with that son of a bitch from behind and I'm going to get his ass down. You got it? I was like, what am I going to get out of this? You're going to get to keep a job out of this. That's what you're going to get. He said, if you, you do it good, maybe I'll even give you a payday. <laughs> Just in so, so over the top Vince McMahon character stuff. And I remember I said, okay, all right, let me go grab Kurt. And I go back and grab Kurt and go, hey, Kurt, hey, man, would you come with me? Like, uh, can I talk to you for a second? I said, by the way, when you come past the uh, stewardess's spot there, Vince is going to tap you, so be ready for it. And I remember Vince coming, running and grabbing Kurt from behind, an immediate switch, went, boom, down. And uh, Kurt, once again, pinned Vince and put him back on his back. And he said, damn it, Hardy. <laughs> and they actually did a cartoon about that, you know, because it was just like, because he still didn't get Kurt, he blamed me for it. Damn it, Hardy. <laughs> I, Vince didn't mess up. I messed up. <laughs> he ratted him out. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I gave Kurt the, head, the heads up. I was playing both sides. Wow. Double okay. agent. You have a lot going on. AEW, the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast, which we talked about earlier in the podcast. You have your yeah. Twitch channel, The House of Hardy, which, yeah. by the way, I mean, Thank you. yes, House I mean, Hardy. To be uh, a Twitch. Dad with all this. Yeah, oh, it, it's busy. It's a, it's a, quite a juggling act, you know. Uh, I have my AEW career, and then I do third party bookings, which is is so great because we can do those. As you were talking about, the twelfth, where the Hardy Boys reunite, and we're doing a big signing in Massachusetts, and we're also doing a big signing in Jersey as well that we can. Uh, and then we have our Twitch channel, which my lovely wife started, and I, I really enjoy that as well. And so do our kids. It's Twitch.tv House Hardy, and then the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, this podcast that I'm doing with John Alba. That's a a pretty full time gig in itself. So there there is a lot of stuff going on. It's quite the juggling act, but I have gotten pretty good at budgeting my time i've gotten a lot more efficient now that kids are here and like this is a time i have to shut it down and go to sleep i, I i've got responsible i finally half ass grown up so i have a lot on my plate but i think i've done very good at like being able to distribute the load and like still be responsible and timely and, and make time for everything so that, that's that's one of the tricky things but i but i've gotten pretty good at it and the dumbest question of the night i guess is going to be asked where can people find you on social media uh, I am on social media at Matt Hardy brand ac across the board, uh, Twitter, Matt Hardy brand, Instagram, Matt Hardy brand, uh, YouTube, Matt Hardy brand as well. And I'm so excited for this episode of the, the extreme life of Matt Hardy, the brand new. one. I think it's the best one we've done yet where we go back and we go into great detail about the iconic Royal Rumble 2000 first ever tag team ladder match myself and Jeff versus uh, Bub and Devon, the Dudley boys in the match. Amazing. Madison Square Garden and th there's so many great stories just a little sneak peek like we were supposed to have 17 or 18 minutes and they cut five minutes off our match four to five minutes off our match right before we were getting ready to, to go out through the curtain we had about 20 minutes heads up about it and we had a little group discussion we said you know what guys we have so much good content here and it's going to be hard to like take a lot of stuff out without taking away from our story let's just immediately start jump us in the aisle and let's just do everything that we've done. We're going to burn through our shit. And if that means we sell less than normal, fuck it. That's what we're going to do. So if you watch that match, it very much stands up in a, like a modern day AEW match because we are moving a million miles an hour, taking these huge bumps. And we keep coming back like we're all the Terminators. Yeah, but the difference I think was is that at the time, 
you know what I mean? There was a story attached to it and yeah. that just kind of, but that's what I'm, yeah, yes. Yeah, it, it, it really was. And you know what, also something that a lot of people don't think about that match, it was very monumental for this reason. Uh, we, the, 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 the concept and the premise of the match was a tables match where you had to put both your opponents through a table to win the match. But myself and my brother, we also broke out a ladder and utilized the ladder in this match in several different spots. And then chairs were used all throughout the match. This match was almost like the blueprint for the whole TLC craze that would happen later down the road. This was the first 100%. match where we incorporated all of the elements, the tables, the ladders, and the chairs. It was the tag team table match at Royal Rumble 2000. When do you do episodes drop? Uh, every Friday at 6 a.m. So Friday, January the 21st, 6 a.m., that episode will be dropping. And I, I'm so excited for people to listen to it. I think they're going to absolutely love it. So many great behind the scenes stories. And just, I, I talk about all the, the chaos and the carnage and the bedlam that came out of this match. It's a really, really fun listen, especially for a diehard wrestling fan that loves the behind the scenes scoops. Oh, I'll be tuning in. No, absolutely. For everybody at home, the podcast's over. Leave for us. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Matt Hardy, thank you so much for coming on the Wrestling Perspective with us. Thank you, man. This was a blast. It was a lot of fun hanging out with you guys. Thank you for the invite. Thanks for having me on.